Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now, to your host. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sipes Democracy That Delivers podcast series. This is John Morell, Regional Director for Asia Pacific at Sipe. I'm filling in for our Communications Director, Ken Jakes. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Jenny Anderson, Senior Program Officer who manages amongst a broad portfolio of work, Sipes Programming in Cambodia. And our guest today is Professor Sopal Ear of Arizona State University, where he is the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs and Global Development, and he's also uh, an Associate Professor at the Thunderbird School of Management. He's previously taught at Occidental, the Naval Academy, and at Syracuse. He's been a consultant for the World Bank. To put it mildly, he is a credible guest to talk about what's going on today in Cambodia. This episode is part of a series of podcasts that we're doing on authoritarianism, highlighting how authoritarianism, just like democracy, is not a one-size-fits-all model. There are very different types of dictatorships and authoritarian governments all over the world. And uh, Professor Sopal Ear will explain, uh, again, the the dynamics of, of governance in Cambodia, how Cambodia has reached the point where it is today, what he thinks um, Cambodia will turn into next. And most importantly, given that site is, I mean, we're, we're, we design and implement projects. We're not a think tank. And so what are programmatic options that site or other practitioners in the democracy space should look to prioritize in Cambodia moving forward? So, Professor, thank you so much for joining us. If you wouldn't mind, I'd love to jump right into the first question uh, because it's very apropos for Asia. There is a view um, amongst, mostly amongst lay, the, the lay audience, but there is a view that an alternative to democracy that oftentimes could be even better is some form of enlightened dictatorship. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew out of Singapore is often cited, or General Park out of South Korea, a, a non-democratic government that yields disproportionate benefits over and above what, what democracy would have, would have yielded. So again, economists are sometimes fond of authoritarian regimes because a few of them have produced good economic outcomes. What is your response to that, Professor? Again, this notion that this idealized model of an enlightened dictatorship can be superior to democracy, is that a valid point of view in in your opinion, Professor? Sure. And John, thank you for inviting me on this uh, podcast. This idea of, of the benevolent dictator who produces economic growth it's very alluring, right? There are examples, there are a few examples, but the problem with looking at it only from the perspective of who wins in this game of you know, forms of government and, and ends up essentially having a successful outcome, economic performance, is that you have to look at the, the bigger picture. The, if you studied the lottery, for example, and only looked at the winners of the lottery, you would conclude that if you play the lottery, you would win the lottery. 100% of the time? No, actually it would be less than 1% of the time, right? So so what about all the losers of this lottery game that end up with not benevolent dictators, but, but dictators who destroy their country, destroy their economy? Those are far, far more than, than the successful outcomes. So if you look at the Philippines, Marcos, decades of economic failure, uh, chaos. Uh, if you look at you know Mubarak in Egypt, again, decades there, there are a lot of examples of, of many more examples of, of situations where you've got what seems to be a, uh, a, a dictatorship that was initially targeting economic performance and then ends up being corrupt, so corrupt that uh, all the growth is sucked out of the economy and all you've got left is rent-seeking behavior and, uh, and just the inability to produce uh, for the people, right? So, so, and the problem, of course, is that once you're stuck with them, you, you can't get out of that, right? You, you, you have to suffer decades and decades under this dictator and maybe their son and their relatives and so on. And, and that can set you back so far that you can't even compete later on. So that's the problem. It's, it's, it's what social scientists like myself call selecting on the dependent variable. When you select on the thing that you're trying to see the outcome for, right? So you're choosing your your examples from countries that have successful outcomes in terms of of benevolent dictators, but you're not looking at the other side of the ledger, the the losers, 
which far outnumber the winners. So that's really the the main lesson there. Yeah. Look at the entire picture, and you'll see you'll see that there's a lot of losers out there. And and if I may, uh, before uh, I know Jenny has a question she'd like to ask, but just to follow up on on this exact point, the the myth of the benevolent dictator. If I may, I'm not Cambodian, and so I, I don't want to be overly forward and harsh in, in talking about the government of Cambodia, but the government of Cambodia is not a democracy. It really doesn't even pretend to be anymore. But for quite a long time, it was. I mean, the Cambodia was a country on the rise, a, a high performer on a lot of international indices of technocratic governance reform, thriving tourism industry, which is remarkable given where Cambodia was just a generation ago. But a, a problem, in my view, not being a political scientist, so I need things put simply in order to understand them. One of the inherent problems with the notion of a benevolent dictator, whether you're in Asia, Africa, or wherever, is that what happens if the dictator wakes up one morning and decides not to be benevolent anymore? You know, the couple of elections, uh, Hun Sen had a pretty rough go of things. And so the most recent one, he made sure he wasn't going to lose. And so when you have a dictator, when you have someone with unchecked power, Someone who basically has the power to legislate by decree, which Hun Sen basically has. Again, it's all well and good until he wakes up one morning and decides I'm not going to be benevolent anymore. You can see it out of Turkey. You can see it in many places where what was thought to be a benevolent dictator, we keep using that term, turned into something else as the dictator aged. And as you said, if you don't like it, better hope his son is better uh, because there's no way of getting rid of him. Right. And, and that's that's the main problem. Right. I alluded to that in terms of once you're stuck with a person, you can't get rid of him because you've gotten rid of democracy. Democracy provides the guardrails, provides the the the, the kind of scope in which the person can operate. Right. Their term ends and they have to run again or there are limited terms and you can't just keep running over, you know, uh, for more and more t- elections, which in the case of Cambodia, we've had the same uh, prime minister for over 35 years. The level of accountability that disappears as a result of that. I mean, I think I think of a rule of thumb as 10 years is usually enough, right? Beyond 10 years, it gets a little bit sketchy in terms of, is somebody going to be willing to say, Mr. Prime Minister, you're wrong about this. We, we have to think about it differently. Or we have to take a different approach. That's really the issue. And then to have that hereditary type of situation where he names or says that his choice is his son means that, you know, you, you end up with a kind of democratic monarchy in the sense that the anointment of a successor is a kind of a fait accompli. Yeah, I mean, I look, I agree that the economic numbers that have come out of Cambodia in the last uh, couple of decades have been very impressive. I mean, you have, you know, nearly double digit growth in certain years uh if not double digit and then an average of like 7 plus percent so it's it's very attractive but i would also say that the problem isn't that democracy made that growth less attractive i would say that if only cambodia had had less corruption during the last two decades its growth numbers would have been even more impressive right so just let the economy function according to the way in which it's supposed to, instead of interfering or instead of land grabbing or instead of of rent seeking, and you'll have even better numbers. But, you know, I I accept that that perhaps overall, if you were to compare what we keep calling a benevolent dictator versus a democratic regime, you might have on average lower levels of growth in a democracy and potentially higher levels of growth in a in a benevolent dictatorship situation. But if you if you hit a dud, if you hit somebody who's who's basically not able to perform, uh, you might be stuck with them for decades, in which case there's the outcome that you fear the most, which is decades of slow to negative economic performance and a degradation of, of living standards uh, that you can't get out of because you don't have those safeguards to say, hey, it's time to change governments. It's time to have that hold that, that election when the, your elections are meaningless and, um, and there's really no competition. And you're, you refer to that, John, the, um, the fact that, that he removed or arranged to have the main opposition party dissolved from a Supreme Court decision. That essentially took out the accountability that kept the fire under him of course, he'll say, you know, within the party, within his own ruling party, there's accountability. That's what China says, you know, within the Communist Party, there's accountability, there's competition within. But actually, 
how do we know that that'll continue? What if he becomes supreme and he is certainly headed that way? There's not going to be anybody willing to say, I, I don't think we're headed in the right direction and we need to change course, Mr. Prime Minister. Very well put. Jenny, you want to chime in? Yeah, to maybe add to this, I think around the world, many countries would like to support Cambodia during this time of crisis. But there's always the possibility, especially Cambodia's history, that any outside intervention will actually make things worse. So, Paul, in your assessment, is there a constructive intervention that could change Cambodia's trajectory and shift it more towards a democratic path? Well, you know, I, I've studied this. This was my first book, the topic of aid dependence in Cambodia, how foreign assistance undermines democracy, published by Columbia University Press. And so I'm, I'm very good at saying why there's a problem with foreign intervention in the sense that the, the argument I made in the book was that foreign aid in high levels uh, substitutes for taxation. So, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're in the DC DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. And the main motto you'll see on license plates out of DC is taxation without representation, right? So the argument I make is no taxation means no representation. In other words, the Cambodian authorities are, were for a long time happy to receive foreign aid and then not really pay that much attention to formal taxation. They were, of course, very interested in informal taxation, meaning bribe taxes, corruption, and various other means of extracting wealth from, from the people. But, but officially, their tax revenues were, were not very high. And, and so it made it look like, oh, it's a low tax economy. It, it seems like people aren't really... And, and look, the accountability link is there, right? So if you don't pay taxes... You don't feel like the government won't feel like listening to you because you're not you're not really paying their bills. But of course, if you pay taxes, then you will demand accountability. You will want your roads to be fixed. You will want better health care and you will, you will want better schools. And and that's that's the problem. Right. So in the sense that foreign intervention can sometimes do that. Yes, it can. Absolutely. It, it can unintentionally. And it's the. It's the adage of, you know, the road to disaster is paved with good intentions, right? It's, it's this idea that you're trying to do good. You're the good Samaritan, but you have to somehow cross paths with this um, corrupt regime. And you've got to do things to, in order to get things done. But, but they're willing to, of course, take, take their cut of it. And here, the issue, I think, is that, you know, we've seen in Cambodia that external intervention. And we see it, of course, now it's not so much foreign aid anymore. It's Chinese assistance. It's the Belt and Road Initiative. And the worry, of course, is that they're certainly not going to listen to the Cambodian people whose lives are going to be impacted by it. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of an old professor of mine, James Robinson, who co-authored Why Nations Fail, and he tells a story of going to Cambodia where he asks a farmer, what is development? And this farmer says, development is they build a road and steal my land. That's what development is to this person. It isn't that development is the road being built and my life will be better. It's that literally somebody in the government, somebody knows where the road is going to be built and doesn't even bother buying the land, just steals it from from this farmer because it's going to be valuable land. It's going to become some infrastructure that wasn't there before, making the that land skyrocket in value. So that's how people meet development frequently. And that's not obviously the outcome that I thought when I worked at the World Bank or the United Nations Development Program for uh, USAID as a grantee. That that it's for me it was it was eye opening to hear that. Now you asked for solutions. I know I've been skirting around <laughs> the idea uh, of what might actually happen. Well, I mean, you know, I think I think if you have high compliance companies, if you have trade and the kinds of sort of economic activities that bring in the private sector, not a private sector that is interested in, in, you know, bribing in order to gain a monopoly advantage, which I've studied in Cambodia, right? You have one of the largest mobile uh, phone operators. I met the, the gentleman who actually came in and started that company as a joint venture. And he told me that he brought a suitcase with over a million dollars in it, in cash, in order to pay for a patent that would give him the right, his company, the right to have prepaid calling in Cambodia. At the time, there wasn't prepaid calling. So he just basically said, we, we want protection for prepaid calling for our company. And for six months, the authorities gave his company patent, he says, 000001, in which gave him a the right to have prepaid calling. You wouldn't think prepaid calling was a patentable idea, 
But they did it in Cambodia and they gave him that protection. Of course, with network effects, what that meant was his company ended up being the only company with prepaid calling for six months and people flocked to it because everything was postpaid. You know, you would use the phone and then you pay after the fact and so on. And it would cost a lot of money while well, prepaid. You just go and you get your money as a, as a company that got there first because you would get your revenues. You would book your revenues through those cards anyway. So by way of solutions, foreign intervention. Yeah. Uh, high compliance company, companies that don't come in and want bribes, companies that, that try to keep labor standards high, that don't fight unions right to organize, that pay the minimum wage, that don't use child labor. Those are the things that I think could really help in terms of, of foreign intervention. And of course, when the time is, there's an appropriate time as well for sanctions in the sense of, you know, global Magnitsky human rights accountability standards, right? I mean, if you've got people who are engaged in, in terrible human rights abuses, they should be glow magged, as the term goes, so that, uh, so that they can't, you know, hold U.S. dollar bank accounts, hold U.S. assets and so on. So there's targeted sanctions. There's there's there are different tools that that are in the levers of, of great powers, as well as middle powers to uh, exercise and to promote certain standards uh, in terms of human rights, in terms of labor rights, in terms of environmental standards and intellectual property standards. If, if I could ask a, a question, Professor, uh, and this will reflect my, um, will, it will reveal maybe my ignorance about Cambodia, but I know in just looking at Cambodia's history, the, well, for much of the several hundred years prior to the French arriving, Cambodia was a constant struggle with Siam and Vietnam. Now, obviously, it was the French. And there's the disastrous, heartbreaking experiment with communism under, under the Khmer Rouge. Cambodia really has never been a democracy before. It's had moments of it, but then they're followed up by a coup or, you know, you wind up with, with someone like the current prime minister. So maybe if I could just ask a very elemental question, is democracy a viable form of government? And, and, and in what, how does it come about? I mean, Hun Sen is who he is. It's hard to imagine he's going to, you know, have a, a, a profound change of heart in terms of how he's going to go about doing his job. So given that Hun Sen is who he is, He's already starting to line up who his successor will be, uh, his son. What are democracy's prospects in Cambodia? It's fascinating. You should pose it this way, John. Actually, when I was 16 years old, I wrote a, uh, a newspaper article called Are We Ready for Democracy? And this was at the start of the Paris Peace Accords, uh, right, at, right following, I think, UNTAC, the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia coming into the country and organizing those first elections. You know, I, I think it's it's tempting to think of certain cultures or countries as being inherently non-democratic in their in their um, in in their approach to uh, civic life. Um, it's really, I, I would say, you know, this is a debate that I teach at uh, at the Thunderbird School of Global Management. This, this idea of, you know, Lee Kuan Yew proposed Asian values, uh, which for him meant that you have to respect your leaders, you have to defer. You have to think of the family first, uh, not the individual. And uh, and it was, you know, I, 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 Kim Dae-jung of South Korea who, who countered that in, in, uh, in foreign affairs in which he said it's the myth of Asian values. It's this myth that, that we have in Asia non-democratic sort of ways of thinking. And that fits right into the hands of somebody like Prime Minister Hun Sen, right? I mean, it, it kind of it feeds into the mentality that, well, you know, you should believe that uh, the the ruler has your best interest in mind and the ruler will deliver economic performance and therefore uh, don't question the leader. If you question the leader, you're inherently questioning the legitimacy and the system and therefore uh, you're not allowing for the fact that that he's brought peace to Cambodia for all these years, these decades, and then brought economic performance. But, um, you know, I, I think people, the idea of self-determination, just the, the fact that the long march of history has been for increased human rights overall, right? I mean, we, we used to live in in villages where the tribe would look at at the other side of the mountain and say, these are, these are foreigners, these are outsiders, these are the alien other. But we've we've come a long way from that. We've become, you know, nation states and 
suddenly our tribe is our country and and maybe even someday we might think of the world as our home instead of thim- simply our country as our home becoming more global in our in our perspective which is something that the thunderbird school is all about this global mindset and being able to think more globally and a- appreciating cultures from elsewhere so in that sense cambodia i think is is becoming certainly much more attuned to with Facebook, with social media, to the ideas um, that uh, it its young people can expect accountability of, of of their leaders, that its young people can want to have freedom of expression and the ability to to think for themselves as opposed to be told what they can think and what's within the scope of of permissible thought. Yeah, so you you get you get people who occasionally will go on Facebook and will say things like. You know, the, the government is authoritarian and then they'll be arrested right afterwards. But that'll only prove that the government is authoritarian. This is exactly the point, right? That only an authoritarian government would do something like this, find offense at being called authoritarian and then arrest the person. So I know, I know that for Cambodians who who feel that that the taste of, of democracy in 1993 has since gone sour or is no longer really uh, uh, is, is just a distant memory that they probably think that that maybe democracy just isn't right for a country like Cambodia. But I think I think that democracy, democracy, and and it's in many forms, right? I'm not talking about oh, we have to have bicameral, we have to have you know certain processes that look exactly like you know the American system of democracy. No, I'm just talking about democratic governance, the 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 right to to choose your leaders, the the right to to elect who who represents you. That this is a just a basic idea that that I, even in a country like Cambodia that hasn't experienced effective democracy, it can function. It's just it's just that we've had actually a very bad run with a leader who's stayed in power for a long time and, and hasn't been willing to to cede that power. Uh, I think I think that that's that's the that's the conclusion one might have from looking at the evidence. And instead, you know, it's it, we have to believe in that hope that people can choose and will have the right to choose their representatives. Thank you so much, Professor. That was very well put. We only have a couple of minutes left. Time for one more question. Jenny, let's Great. let's get our money's worth for how much time we have left <laughs> with uh, with Dr. Sopal. So. All right. To sort of wrap up our conversation, maybe taking a step back a little bit more regional in view. Cambodia will be the chair of ASEAN in 2022. In your opinion, could this role strengthen already existing authoritarian tendencies by having a strong leadership role in the region? Or could it possibly help increase accountability with its role in the spotlight? What are your thoughts? Well, I, if one looks at history, one would not uh, expect Cambodia to, to have that latter outcome, the, the increased accountability. Unfortunately, the last time Cambodia chaired ASEAN in 2012, uh, it took that opportunity to promote China's agenda uh, on the South China Sea and uh, didn't just do that. I mean, I, it, it went the extra mile and more. Right. So I, I remember that, you know, at one point uh, it, it even said that ASEAN would not internationalize the South China Sea dispute, which was the word internationalize the dispute is the word that the Chinese foreign ministry uses. So they basically took the exact same wording and repeated it as chair of ASEAN. And, and prior to that, they blocked the ability to, um, to have, uh, to have a, a joint communique, you know, right? like that for 40 plus years, ASEAN has always had a final statement, however watered down it was. But that year, it couldn't come up with anything until after the meeting had ended. And, and it was because of the South China Sea. Uh, now for 2022, I think, you know, Cambodia is trying to look very serious in the sense that the prime minister has already said he offers to go to Myanmar, Burma to uh, without preconditions to talk to the to the generals there. I think that it's an attempt to deflect attention, actually, on the fact that Cambodia itself has not done very well in terms of human rights or democracy, right, in the last few years. If anything, it kind of says, we, Cambodia, are going to try to fix the problem of Myanmar, Burma, and, and, and the coup that took place there. That's, that's, that, that's advantageous for, for the Cambodian authorities, but I think it actually, we should, we should be raising the fact that you've got a chair that is deeply, deeply problematic and, and, and non-performing in terms of its responsibilities to its people. And that, uh, if anything, the focus should, should be on not just Myanmar, Burma, but on, on Cambodia as well in terms of 
of not doing well. And I, of course, there are plenty of regimes in, in, in Southeast Asia that, that aren't democratic. I mean, you've got Vietnam, you've got Laos. I mean, but still, you know, as a country that receives so much money for its democratic process, Cambodia has, has returned very little in, in, in terms of return on investment, right? And the prime minister has, has even deigned to say that what was happening before was fake democracy and what's happening now in Cambodia with the elimination of the opposition, main opposition party is true, is real democracy, which is, of course, you know, flipping the script on its head completely and, and saying that black is white and white is black. But that's his specialty, you know, aside from collecting million dollar watches uh, from uh, luxury watchmakers in Europe. That's just something that we have to deal with. And, and I hope certainly that as chair of ASEAN, Cambodia does a better job. Uh, but uh, I have to be realistic that at every turn, China will probably be dictating what Cambodia does next in terms of, you know, moves that affect China, because they're best buddies and they, and, and one will want the other to perform. So unfortunately, that's, that's a reality. Yes, as well put, Professor. And yeah, you, you, you cited the, the last time uh, Cambodia chaired ASEAN. Yeah, that was the one time in ASEAN's history that ASEAN couldn't agree on a joint communique because Cambodia vetoed any language that even insinuated that China was doing something it shouldn't be doing with all the fake islands in the South China Sea, uh, or if you talk to Filipinos, the, uh, the West Philippine Sea. But yeah, and so the, the odds that the ASEAN, uh, Cambodia's chairmanship of ASEAN will be a force for progress, the odds aren't good, but we can hope, can't we? We can hope, yes. Professor, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to speak with us, to join us today. Professor uh, Sopal Ear of Arizona State University, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise, and uh, we hope to have you back sometime soon. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.